Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. So uh, most of this is joint work with uh, Howie Pai, David Su, Michael Kochendefer, Han Ben Ngo, Yi Wang, and Kok Song Wood. So let me start with a few uh, motivating examples of uh, users of Pompey Peace. Uh, OK, so uh, Bayesian reinforcement learning would be uh, one possible use of POMDP. So in this particular example, uh, what we want to do is we want to drive the car safely past this intersection uh, without really knowing uh, a lot of the parameters of the other driver, like the driver imperfection, reaction time, acceleration, deceleration parameters of the other driver, uh, right, which could model things like you know, the driver could be drunk or uh, you know, he could be driving erratically and uh, other things. So uh, the sort of actions that we could do is uh, at every time step, we could accelerate, maintain speed, or decelerate. Right? And the sort of observations you might get on which you have to sort of learn sort of the model and at the same time make the right decisions so that you can drive past safely, you know, include sort of the location and the speed of the other driver. Okay, so this is uh, one motivating example. Uh, Another one would be dialogue systems. So uh, let me see if I can get this video going. Uh, so this is a video by, I think, Jason Williams. So let's. Hello, how may I help you? Hi, I'm looking for an Indian, or actually maybe an Italian restaurant. Let me confirm, you are looking for a venue and that serves Indian food. No. Hole in the wall is a great Italian restaurant. Okay, so uh, this is an example of a dialogue system. So our aim is essentially to find out what the other the person wants. And the sort of actions you can do is to ask questions. And the observations will be the output of the speech recognizer. Right, so in this particular uh, video example, uh, the system was doing something a bit clever. Right? The, it wasn't sure whether uh, the person wanted Indian or is Italian restaurant, and it asked whether the person wanted an Italian restaurant, the person's not Indian restaurant, the person said no, and then it recommended an Italian restaurant. Okay. Uh, assistive techno technology, this is uh, a system that was, I think, trial in the in Canada uh, for assisting uh, elderly people with dementia to sort of remind them when they wash their hands, right? To sort of prompt them. So the sort of things you, the aim would be to assist people with dementia when they wash their hands, and the sort of actions you can do is just to prompt the person when, uh, right? The, if they keep washing their hands and never stop, then you would prompt them. Uh, so the observations would be the video of the activity. Uh, okay, so uh, we have done a little bit of work on this. So this is uh, to maneuver a U UAV to avoid uh, collision with nearby aircraft, right? So the observations would be sort of the sensor, which on a UAV is, has quite limited views because of sort of weight consideration. I think it has uh, fairly limited angles uh, in terms of where it can observe. So you have to maneuver the UAV in order to find where the other aircraft is and then avoid it. Okay, so uh, these examples, uh, they all can be formulated as uh, partially observable Markov decision processes, or POMDPs for short. Right? The sort of things you need to do is to learn, estimate, or track the current states or parameters. In the case of uh, Bayesian reinforcement learning, th those would be the parameters of the system from the observations, the history of actions and observations. And then based on your estimate, uh, of the states, then you need to select an action that is good not only now but in future, right? Maybe a fair bit into the future, uh, you will actually see the 
effect of your actions. Uh, the other uh, sort of things in common in the examples I showed you is that uh, sort of they are sort of quite large in terms of the state space and uh, in the case of parameter space some of them are infinite parameter spaces. Right? So uh, the sort of aim of this talk is more to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how, this, how we scale the, prob uh, the solver to start, uh, solve very large or infinite uh, state space problems. Uh, okay, but I think first I have to give you some background on uh, POMDPs and solving uh, discrete POMDPs where all the states and observations they are all discrete, right? And then how we use sort of sampling techniques to sort of extend the discrete uh, solvers to solve uh, continuous uh, problems. Uh, okay, so I'll just go through the process. If you are familiar uh, with FormDPs, please bear with me so that we sort of get the notation right. If you are not, hopefully uh, this would sort of uh, give you the definitions. Right? So uh, a POMDP can be defined uh, usually by uh, S, A, T, R, omega, and O, where S is the set of states, A is the set of actions, and uh, Omega is a set of observations. So the actions are sort of defined, uh, the outcome of the actions are defined by transition functions, right, which is just a conditional probability. Right? To know what uh, the next state is, it's just a conditional probability of the previous state. And uh, if I take this particular action, then what's the probability of going into a particular next state? So that's the transition functions, uh, which corresponds to particular actions, right? each one. Uh, observation would tell you uh, from the current state and if I take a particular action, what's the likely things that you're going to see. Right? So it's uh, again defined by a probability distribution. And uh, the other thing which uh, allows you to sort of design how uh, the agents react would be the reward function. If uh, you're in this particular state and you take this particular action, Let's see, this particular state, take this particular action and end up in this particular state, what's the reward or penalty that, uh, that you get? Right, so that, I think that defines a POMDP essentially. Uh, a MDP, if you like, is a special case of a POMDP, the Markov or fully observed Markov decision process. That'll be the case where the observation uh, is the same as the state, where you actually observe the state. So that's a Markov, uh, commonly called a Markov decision process. Right? So uh, what's different about the partially observable case is uh, right, need, this need not be what the actual state is. You observe something, a function of distribution. Uh, this one, so those are all hidden variables, the ones on the top. Uh, uh, the states are hidden, hidden, yes. And the rest is all observable. Uh, yes, the rest are the actions, uh, observe, they're observed. So these are the states. So the states are the main thing that are hidden, and so those, that's what uh, we sort of need to keep track on, keep track of. And the common terminology in uh, POMDP is to call this a belief, which is a probability distribution of the states, right, which we need to sort of infer and keep track of. Uh, so if I have a distribution, then uh, as a shorthand, I'm going to write the expected reward this way. Right? I have a reward for every state and action, so I can uh, compute the expected reward. Uh, and the object when we do a POMDP, the thing that we are interested in getting when we say we solve a POMDP is a policy. That's a mapping from belief, which is the distribution which we know or we can uh, infer from. Uh, and then for any distribution, we want to know what's the right action to take. Okay, so it's a mapping from a belief to an action. And what we are interested in, so given a policy, we can compute what's called uh, the value function, okay? which is uh, a function that tells you at every belief, if I follow uh, this particular policy pi, uh, what's sort of the long term, the sum of the reward at every step till infinity. Okay? So uh, normally we use a discounted reward, there's a gamma here, which is uh, less than 1, between 0 and 1. And, uh, this is done for mathematical convenience, if you like. Otherwise, this would sum up to infinity and uh, you have problems. Uh, you can also view this as sort of uh, things that are far away into the future we value less. So it's a discounted uh, reward 
that you care about right now. Okay, so this is the uh, value function. And what we are interested in normally would be the optimal value function, which is, or the optimal policy, uh, which is the value that corresponds to uh, you know, doing the best possible. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about the belief and a little bit about the value function to give you a bit of background. So uh, belief, uh, what it is, is you have an initial belief, which I didn't put here, B0. And then based on the history of actions and observation, you want to compute what's the probability of the current state. Right? So that's a belief. Uh, there's a closed form update. So, uh, so when the number of states is small, this is uh, good. Right? It uh, has a Markov property. All you need to know is the belief. And you can forget everything that has happened in the past. If you have the belief, you know everything about the past. Right? And it's a, so it's a finite sufficient statistics when the states uh, is finite. The state space is fine. So uh, sometimes, oops, sometimes I might use this particular notation to denote the next state given the current next belief. Given the current belief, if I take this particular action and I see this observation, this is sort of the next belief. Yes. Sorry. Uh, for now, yes. For now, they are all discrete state, discrete actions. Uh, later on, I'll talk about continuous state, but still discrete everything else. Uh, okay, so the value function. Uh, it, so I'll talk a little bit about the properties of the value function, uh, because it will sort of help uh, understand some of the uh, ideas. So for a uh, finite horizon, which means sort of a case that look ahead uh, just k steps, right? instead of going uh, infinitely into the future, we can actually represent this as a piecewise linear uh, convex. So it's a max of uh, a set of linear functions of the belief. Okay, so this is a, a nice property of the value function. Uh, it's not that hard to see, so I'll just sketch why that is. Right? So uh, the way we construct to show this, one way to show this is to start with a horizon one problem. I'm just going to take one action. Right? And then if you look at the uh, value function or the uh, expected reward, that's just a linear function of the belief. Okay, so for each action, I then get a piece a linear function. So I have, uh, in this case, if I have two actions, then I only get two, uh, two linear functions, and I'm interested in the max of this. Right? So, for any particular belief, if I take action A2, I will get this particular value. If I take action A1, I will get this particular value. I'm interested in the better one. Uh, OK. Then what we can do if we are interested in a horizon 2 is we can use horizon 1 to construct a horizon 2 value function. right? And uh, the operator is called a backup operator. So I'm going to use this a fair bit uh, later on. So. Uh, what a backup operator is, if you like, is just to look at the current uh, belief, look one step ahead, right? take a one action and uh, get one set of observations. And then at this point, take the, say if I'm constructing a two-step look ahead function, look at the best one-step look ahead function here. Right? That way I can construct a two-step look ahead sort of function. Right? So uh, it's just a max of the, this particular expression reward plus sort of look one step ahead and then the best possible value function at, uh, for i minus one steps. Uh, okay, so, you know, so by induction you can show that uh, if at ta step i minus one it's a piecewise linear max of uh, linear functions then at time i, i steps then it's also a piecewise, max of piecewise linear functions. Uh, for every belief, for every belief you can, uh, in this case, for every belief you can get a value, and then you can uh, you can so sort you, action, right? you can either do sort of a one step look ahead to get an action, which say if I, I test out every action that I have and see which one gives the highest value, or uh, you, during construction you can also store together with the uh, the the linear function which particular action gave you this uh, this particular uh, linear function. Right. 
So, uh, yeah. So essentially, you get a mapping from the belief to a value in, in this case. And also, you can get it to an action, if you like. Uh, OK. So th this is sort of quite nice, right? So this gives you a way to construct uh, value functions, uh, except that it, it's not tractable, right? So uh, uh, for horizon k problems, uh, the set of linear functions would grow uh, doubly exponentially in the horizon. The way to see this is that uh, each particular linear function you have corresponds to a particular policy tree, right? Uh, you know, take particular action and for every particular observation, uh, join it to another subtree. Okay. So, and if I have a uh, height, especially height k tree, this is sort of the, num the number of possible trees. So this is the number of possible uh, uh, linear functions. So th this is uh, really badly intractable. Uh, OK, so a little bit more about the infinite horizon. So if we take the limit of the finite horizon case, uh, what would happen is that the uh, algorithm that I just described to you just now would converge to a unique convex function, regardless of how you initialize it. Right? And, uh, you know, usually uh, we are interested in actually uh, being able to do this, so usually we approximate this using a finite number of what we call alpha vectors, right, which is the linear functions. Uh, the value functions satisfy the Bellman optimality, the optimal function equation, which just says uh, that V star is equal to the max of all this, and then also V star here. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Doing uh, the exact sort of construction of the value function is not tractable, right? Because it uh, blows up doubly exponentially with the horizon, with the number of steps ahead. Uh, so, what over the last eight years, ten years, what people have done is a series of work to try to approximate this. Instead of sort of uh, constructing the exact value function, uh, what people do is they do uh, sort of point-based backups. They only do backups at a sort of selected set of beliefs. Okay, instead of uh, doing backup everywhere or constructing every possible policy tree, they would just do selective uh, backup, selective locations in the belief space. Right. Uh, the, these solvers typically still use uh, alpha vectors or they still represent the value function as a piecewise linear uh, convex value function, max of linear functions. Uh, right, but uh, the so this is sort of a series of work. Uh, the difference is that instead of doing uh, the backup, which is global, right, define at every B, we only do this operation at a selected set of beliefs. Right? So we only find the best alpha vector uh, locally, if you like, from all the ones that can be constructed. So I have a current set of vectors, uh, tau, I think, right, which I can place here to sort of extend the tree, right? But I'm only going to do it at a fixed selected set of points instead of globally everywhere. So uh, what uh, it, the alpha vector that I construct or the policy tree that I construct is only going to you know, be really good only in the neighborhood of these points where you run the backup from, right? Uh, OK, so but then, of course, you gain in computation right? compared to a doubly exponential growth in the alpha vector set. For exact, if you do the exact uh, computation, then uh, right, you only uh, get computational cost that's proportional to the number of actions, number of observations, and the size of the current uh, set of policies or current set of vectors that you have right now. Okay, so now the main idea is to back up at single point rather than globally. Uh, okay, so a little, one last slide on the background. Uh, the representation of the policy, so I've told you you can represent it as sort of piece, as a piecewise linear function, convex, uh, or set of alpha vectors, max of a set of alpha vectors. Uh, this is roughly equivalent to a set of trees, set of policy trees, so that gives you another representation. Uh, you can merge uh, subtrees that are identical. Right, to give you a directed acyclic graph, uh, we call that a policy graph. Or if you allow loops, then you end up with a finite state controller. 
Right, so these are some of the uh, representations that, uh, that at least we, we have been using. Uh, okay, so that's sort of the background. I'll talk a little bit about uh, solving how to solve uh, these problems, at least the way uh, we have been doing it recently. Uh, so the problem's intractable, as you might expect. It's B space complete, uh, so it's really bad. Uh, in fact, it's uh, so bad that uh, not, not only is uh, the problem P space complete trying to get a small policy. So a policy is something like what I showed you just now, trees or graphs or any functions that is small, polynomial size. I it's not possible to get a small policy uh, and be able to compute the best action online in polynomial time under uh, complexity uh, assumptions. Right, so it's a pretty bad problem. Uh, so what we have been doing is uh, we have been sort of trying to solve the easier problems, trying to see if we can find uh, some indicators when the problem might be easier and then try to uh, you now see what, what mileage we can get, right? So you know, hopefully many practical problems are actually not so hard. So you know, the idea is if we knew how to represent them and search for the solution, we could do some of the easier problems. Uh, okay, so I'll describe a little bit about some of the easier problems. Uh, so one thing you can do to make it easier is to say, uh, right, ne Let's not care about the entire space of all possible belief. If I know the starting point, let's only care about the set of beliefs that I can reach under arbitrary set of action and observation. So I, I sort of shrink my space that are from all possible beliefs to all that can be reached from a starting point. So we call this the reachable space from B0. Okay. So that's uh, one, one step that makes the problem a little bit easier. Okay, uh, so I told you just now that uh, what you can do to solve this problem is to select a set of points and then run a point-based backup on those set of points. Right? You, uh, one, one way to do this is essentially just that. Select set of beliefs and then keep running uh, backups and it will converge to something. Right? So what you can show, what you want to show is if the set of points cover the space well, then the approximation error is small. Then you get a good value function. Right? And it's possible to show that. So, uh, and if the, we can find this set of points easily, then it's also efficient. Okay, so just a little bit of definitions of you know, what we actually use in the technical result. So we just use a epsilon cover, epsilon net, or delta cover, we just call it a delta cover, uh, to cover the set of uh, the, belief, the reachable belief space. So if I have a belief space B, reachable belief space, a delta cover is just a set of points uh, C, which is a subset of this belief space such that any point in the belief space is not too far away, is uh, with a distance delta from one of these points in C. Okay, so that's uh, a delta cover, and the delta covering number is just the smallest such set, the size of the smallest such set. Uh, for the results, we use the L1 metric, the belief. Uh, so you can show that uh, if the reachable belief space is small, then uh, you can construct a policy or a value function with a small approximation error uh, in time roughly uh, quadratic to the size of the covering number. Okay, so uh, I, okay, let, me, let me quickly see give you a little bit of... Uh, so it, essentially, the, all, all you need to do is to find a set of points, that's a delta cover, and then if you keep running the backups, uh, the property of the backups, which includes sort of the... from the sort of piecewise linear, you can get lip switch bounds on how far you need to be uh, to get reasonable errors, and, uh, and so on, right? So why, one of the key ideas is just, you know, can, can I find all the set of points that cover this space? So one of the first thing is uh, I don't need to cover the entire reachable space if I'm interested only at B0. So uh, discounting means an O of log of epsilon is sufficient, so I can cut off my tree there. 
and then uh, I have a finite set of beliefs which out of which I need to find a cover right and uh, this is uh, not hard to do what you do is you do a defer search is uh, good enough right uh, you maintain a set of uh, beliefs and you do a defer search every time you find a new uh, belief you check whether it's you know too far away from the set of uh, beliefs that you already have if it is you just add it in right that gives you a packing which is related to covering and uh, you know you if the space is actually small if the covering number is actually small then you can uh, you can find this uh, fairly quickly right in terms of uh, the size of the covering number okay and then you just run uh, the backup operations which is just to remind you so I'll look ahead one step and then propagate the information uh, backwards keep doing that and then the information will sort of all gets propagated back up to uh, give you a reasonable value function uh, okay so that's sort of the main idea uh, okay, so this would seem nice but uh, like it is pretty uh, it's very restrictive right because uh, if, uh, if you just do simple discretization then uh, the size of the covering number you know, a bound on the covering number is going to be uh, exponential in the number of states right, number of states uh, but you know in practice there are a lot of structure right like uh, you know often a set of uh, the state variables is actually fully observed so that cuts down the covering number if the beliefs are sparse or they're affected they're smooth you can show that uh, it sort of helps reduce the covering number right or their structure in the transition matrices uh, so the in terms of sort of the algorithm itself the algorithm itself is uh, sort of quite nice in the sense that it doesn't really need to know all this is uh, based on just uh, right starting from an initial belief and then finding a set of points and then running back up on that set of points so every every set of point that you find is actually uh, you know on on the reachable space so if your reachable space is a low dimensional manifold or if it's sparse or whatever it will automatically be uh, captured by this point based algorithms right so the point based point based algorithms would automatically capture uh, this this type of properties if it exists uh, okay so uh, so like I said it's quite restrictive uh, for in the first place very small num very few applications have small number of states and it's exponential uh, in the number of states so uh, you know we want to look at something maybe slightly more practical uh, and what, pe what people do in practice is you use heuristic right you don't explore the whole part of the reachable space you try to find useful part of the space and then you try to use branch and bound to eliminate places that you don't need to consider right uh, but all, all this will be effective only if there is small policies right if you can represent uh, in, in this work we are looking at you know actually representing the policy so only be effective if there is small policy so you can give us some sufficient condition for small policies uh, it's again fairly restrictive but uh, there are some right so uh, essentially if I have an optimal policy and this is the space that I will reach if I were to run the optimal policy right so it is quite a lot smaller than uh, every possible policies right that's reachable under every possible action observation so for every belief the optimal policy will only select a one particular action so this space uh, space that's reachable under an optimal policy is a fair bit smaller than the reachable space right? so you can show that uh, the size of the policy you can construct policy in for the form of alpha vector set of alpha vectors or policy graph that is small if the number of the space reachable under an optimal policy is small again uh, restrictive but at least a little bit better than uh, the sort of reachable space uh, okay so this sort of uh, ideas uh, with it you can solve you know sort of problems with say thousands of states and we have a solver you know, can do this sort of I guess they are st mostly still toyish type of problems but uh, right, you can do sort of somewhat interesting things with them uh, 
Okay, I think I'll have to move a bit faster. Uh, okay, so I'm going to move on from this everything discrete to uh, first Bayesian reinforcement learning. Right, so uh, Bayesian reinforcement learning, the sim probably simplest form is just a Markov decision process with unknown parameters. Right, the parameters might be sort of the parameters of the transition matrix, which tells you if I'm in this state, I take this particular action, depending on what the true parameter is, you know, what's the probability distribution of the next state. Uh, so the states now is just the state of the uh, Markov decision process, pro the cross product with the uh, parameter space, which is often continuous. Right? So, it's, uh, so this is uh, discrete, this might be continuous. For example, in our problem just now, uh, we discretize the state space, but then the parameter space will be continuous. Uh, so, right, and we are interested in the base optimal policy, which is to find the best policy that would give sort of the best expected reward under the prior distribution. Right? I have some prior belief of what the world is like, and then I want to find the policy that gives me the best expected uh, reward expected value. Uh, okay, so the main idea here is that we already have discrete solvers, can we exploit that? Right? The problem is the parameters are continuous. For example, in this particular problem, we have continuous parameters for the driver imperfection, reaction time, acceleration, deceleration parameters. So, uh, okay. so if we were to discretize this, uh, quite often this gets really big. So the main trick we use is we just uh, sample. Okay? Uh, we turn the continuous problem into a discrete problem by sampling k hypothesis from the initial belief. Right? So then I'm going to solve the discrete POM DP problem. And then I get a policy and then I'm going to execute the policy. Okay? Uh, the advantages of this approach is you don't need, you're not restricted to special prior distributions, which a lot of prior work, what they do is they uh, restrict themselves to Dirichlet distributions because you can get a lot of uh, nice properties from there. Uh, so we only require that the priors are easy to sample from. Right? And we can exploit uh, discrete POMDP solvers which we have already uh, constructed and it nicely handles both partially and, and fully observable cases for uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, okay, so you can show some nice properties for this approach. Uh, so, for, for example, you can show uh, that, okay, if, let me see, if this is the error, like delta is the approximation error of your discrete solver, right, and uh, this is the output of the value that's output by the, your solver, and this is the optimal policy, then the, uh, you can bound the error in terms of, you know, essentially, it's going to go one on square root of the number of samples that you use, number of models that you pick to form the discrete problem. Right? And uh, the bound is also dependent on the size of the policy that's output by your discrete solver. Right? So it uh, depends on the action size, observation size, and the size of the policy that's output. And also the sample size when you turn your continuous problem into a discrete problem. I think I will skip the proof sketch, but it, essentially what you do is uh, right, you ask the question of if I have this uh, policy and then I sample my model, what's its average reward right, from a finite, how far is the finite sample's uh, size average dif differ from the expected value. Right. And then uh, you do it differently for each controller size and then you put it together using uh, Right. You, you use hefting bound, union bound, the usual tricks, uh, put it together and you can uh, sort of get the bounds that I showed. <laughs> okay, uh, the, so experimental results, so uh, as we increase the number of continuous parameters that we sample to form our discrete problem, you can see that the performance increase and this is sort of the upper bound which is formed by if I knew the true Markov decision process that's uh, being run, right? So this is an upper bound, and you can see that uh, it does quite work quite well. And compared to a handcrafted policy, which doesn't, uh, it's not adaptive, uh, it does fairly well. Uh, okay, 
So I'm going to move on to the last part. Right. So uh, just now, uh, what we had was the state space is discrete, but the parameter space is continuous, and we sampled the parameter space. Uh, right. But what if the state space is also continuous? The same trick will not work. Right? If you sample a fixed set of states in advance, uh, that's probably not going to cover uh, the state space, which changes. The parameter space doesn't, the parameters don't change. You expect there's a fixed parameter for the problem. That doesn't change. But the state is going to change as uh, you go along. Right? For example, in our UAV collision avoidance application, I have 12 continuous state variables in three dimensions. Uh, so if I try to do simple discretization, that's not practical. Right? And what people did in the past is they restrict the problem by sort of taking a 2D slice and then restrict the action to up and down instead of solving the whole 3D problem. Right? So what we want to do is to be able to solve the 3D problem or large problems. Uh, okay, so just to remind you, the point-based solvers, what we did was we used heuristic to get a set of points and then we just repeatedly run these backup operations. Right? So the main idea here is that I'm going to use Monte Carlo sampling to approximate the backup operation. A right, backup operation, to remind you, is to look one step ahead and then uh, propagate the information forward, right? And uh, when we do the backup operation, what we are doing is we are adding an additional node to the policy graph, if you like, or the policy tree, adding one, one new node. Uh, so conceptually, what we, if when we want to do Monte Carlo sampling to find what is the best uh, backup operation to do, or what is the best new graph policy, what's the best new policy that I can construct, is I can test out all possible ways of adding one new node right, to the existing uh, policy, which is a policy graph. And, uh, but, and there are this many of them, and then I can test each one of them, and then I can find the best one, and then uh, right, if I sample enough, I will get uh, this sort of error rate, right, one on square root of n. Right, sample and run simulations, enough of them. So that's roughly the main idea. Uh, computationally, you can do it a bit cheaper by exploiting, you can solve independent problems. So computationally, you can do it in this time instead of uh, this time. But uh, the main idea is roughly you look at all possible ways I can add, construct a new graph from the existing one. Okay. So that's sort of the main idea. And uh, since it's sort of in continuous space, we can't sort of handle it, what we do is we do Monte Carlo sampling to get a good estimate. Uh, right? so we can get a good approximation with high probability if we do enough sampling and uh, simulations. You can get similar sort of results as what I showed you earlier for the uh, discrete space problems. Uh, there are still difficulties. Uh, so right? once you give me a set of beliefs, uh, I'm fine. Uh, all this I can actually show you nice bounds, one on square root of n bounds. Uh, but uh, belief representation is generally a difficult problem, so you need to do some sort of uh, approximate inference usually to get the set of beliefs, right? So you know we are fairly happy once you give us you give me a set of belief, then I'm fairly happy. I can give you a policy. Right? But to find the set of belief in the first place, that's a computationally difficult problem. I think you need to do uh, approximate inference. Uh, a lot of problems actually may not have good small policies, so this method is probably only going to be useful for problems with good small policies. Right? And we still need heuristics, branch and bound, to find a set of good beliefs to use. Uh, OK, so uh, I'm finishing off. So this is the uh, experimental results. So. So we use particle filters to get uh, approximate beliefs So uh, in this 12-dimensional space, continuous space. Right? So you can see uh, if we go into 3D compared to the 2D problem, we get huge, huge gains. And TCAS is the standard thing that's being used in the aircrafts right now. Right? They, are, they are not used for UAVs, they are used for your real aircrafts that you flew on the way here. So that's the case. So for this problem, it does uh, not that great. But th this problem is to fly a UAV, right, an unmanned air vehicle. Uh, if we 
only look at 2D, which is what the previous uh, work did, which is to take a slice and say, I can now only control up and down because I have only a 2D slice of the problem. Uh, that does slightly better than TCAS, but still not that well. But if you go into the whole 3D, right, if you can represent and you can handle, you know, just, I think it's just because you can represent the problem and you can actually run the problem, you have additional freedom of, instead of going just up and down, you can go left and right. So you can avoid collision much, much better. So the, the risk ratio is the ratio of, I think, accidents, collisions, or near collision compared to the baseline, which is do nothing. Right? So you can get uh, probably order of magnitude improvement in the risk ratio. Just be, I think mainly it's not that it's particularly clever, it's more that you can represent the problem. You can now go into 3D and actually run the problem. And you can now go left and right rather than just up and down. Okay, so you can get a large improvement just because you can represent and do something about the problem. Yes. Uh, oh, this, one, this one I think is handcrafted. Right. Yeah, this, this is comparable. Yes. Uh, but you know, it's probably like eight hours uh, running computer time. Uh, yeah, and this is on model, so this is not real, right? Obviously, it's on model constructed by Lincoln Lab uh, using US radar data. Uh, okay, so that's uh, to conclude. Uh, so POMDP is you know, elegant, mathematically elegant. It's very general because you can represent a lot of interesting problems with it for sequential decision problems. Uh, for most applications, actually, uh, you, know, you, you really need to scale to very large or continuous space. And uh, what we have done is we have done some simple uh, sampling methods to scale up uh, the, this uh, solvers to handle uh, these problems. And they, you know, if you look at you know, they are sort of using f tools familiar to those in the uh, machine learning community. Like uh, this is to prove bounds on it, right? To show uh, that no, it does reasonably in some situations, right? So they are using familiar tools. Uh, okay, so I think yeah, that that's it. Thanks. Yes. Like how much alcohol is or whatever it is. And the observables are, let's say, some linear functions or some nice functions. Uh, right. So right, what we have done right now is discrete observations. So uh, in the aircraft collision problem, for example, we just discretize it and say, you know, top left, bottom right. In, so let's say they are real values. They are real values. Uh, and the observable is some linear function or a bunch of linear functions. Okay. Another yes. Right. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Possibly. Yes. Possibly. Uh, but yes. That's, because that seems, I mean, that seems possibly a natural setting where you assume the state vectors are all real vectors. Right. State, real, and. and unobservables. I don't know that they would yep. be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Possibly. I think there, there are some nicer situations where you can get. Uh, but. I think even if the VC dimension is small, the covering number is exponential in the VC dimension. Yes, so yes. it, yeah, yeah. So it's so quite ris very restrictive still. Yes. Maybe you can yeah. use a Dudley entropy integral argument for cases where it's not going to be exponential, but still polynomial. Like there are certain classes where you mm. have that property. Okay, I'm not, not that familiar with them. Maybe you can talk to you offline. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Thank you, speaker. Thanks.